You have to know this. The fact that I'm here matters. The fact that you're there matters. This is no accident. None of us are. Red everywhere, essentially. Down by 4 5%. We're down over 16%. Mr. Gorbachev, open this gate. Because the Muhammad Ali your face in front of me is going to be better than the Muhammad Ali. Our country is strong. A great people has been moved to defend a great nation. Yes, we can. البلد الذي شغلت النزاعات العرقية فيه حيزا كبيرا من تاريخه وسياساته بين الأقلية البيضاء والأكثرية السوداء من جنوب أفريقيا من بلد نيلسون ماندلا وفي كيب تاون نلتقي برجل أعطى أكبر مثال للتنازل لحل مشاكل وطنه وشعبه إنه الحائز على جائزة نوبل للسلام مناصفة مع الراحل نيلسون ماندلا إنه الرئيس الجنوب أفريقي الأسبق فريدريك ويليام ديكليرك من استخدم مشرط الجراح لحل مشاكل وطنه اتخذ قرارا جريئا وحكيما لم يستطع من سبقوه اتخاذه او تجرى احدهم على مجرد التفكير فيه خسر منصب رئاسة الدولة وخسر معه العرق الابيض الذي ينتمي اليه لكي يجنب بلاده ويلة حرب اهلية اوشكت نيرانها ان تشتعل وتحرق الاخضر واليابس وحصار اقتصادي خانق لم تعد البلاد قادرة على مجابهته أنهى نظام الفصل العنصري وأرسى دعائم العدالة والمساواة في بلاده وترجل طوعا عن السلطة ليصبح نائبا للرئيس عن طيب خاطر وقناعة بصواب القرار وحكمته رغم كل إنجازاته وكونه أحد أهم عشرين شخصية في القرن العشرين إلا أن ذلك لم يمنعه من أن يعاني من الجميع من بعض المتشددين البيض الذين يرونه خائنا لقضيتهم وأيضا من السود الذين لم ينسوا أنه كان آخر رئيس للنظام العنصري إنه الرئيس السابق لجنوب أفريقيا فريدريك ويليام دي كليرك Good morning. Hello, welcome. Good, good morning, Mr. Good morning. President. It is really a pleasure and an honor to meet you for many reasons. But you know what's the main reason? It's because many people believe that you are a politician that gave up power for the sake of his people. Thank you, Mr. President, for having us here. It's a great pleasure and welcome to our home. Lovely home. Lovely home. And a lovely yes, day in Cape Town. <laughs> yes, sir. Yes, sir. Can Please we go inside? Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. After you. خمسين عام من الفصل العنصري في جنوب أفريقيا اتسمت بأقصى أنواع القهر الذي مورس ضد المواطنين السود وفي أوج الثورات في العالم والتوجه نحو المزيد من الحريات كان العالم يسير باتجاه وتسير جنوب أفريقيا باتجاه معاكس Mr. President, you won Nobel Prize for many reasons uh, Let me give you some examples you won it because you gave up power for the sake of your people. You even allow yourself to be the vice president after being the president. 
uh, you change the politics game. Uh, rather than holding up power, you gave it away. Uh, let me go back for your early days when you were a child. Who taught you all those principles? I had wonderful parents, uh, but I grew up in a political home, coming from a political family. My two grandfathers were both involved in politics. My great-grandfather was in the first Senate of the Union of South Africa in 1910. My aunt was married to a former Prime Minister, Hans Stredel. My father was a headmaster at the school, but he entered politics when he was about 47 years old and became a minister and served under three consecutive prime ministers in the cabinet and then became president of our Senate. So at our home, always at the evening around the dinner table, we were talking politics. We were talking about the challenges and the issues of the day. I also was greatly influenced in my life, especially as a student, by the university where I went to, where the philosophy was, before you get entangled in the details, first ask which principles are applicable to the situation that you are studying or that you have to face or that you have to handle. Right. And this taught me first to ask what is the heart of this matter that I have to deal with. And once I've decided these principles are applicable, then to come to the point to say, now what action plan must I develop to realize these principles in practice? So when I became the leader of the National Party and the President. We had to develop a new vision based on the principles and the guiding principle was justice. Justice for all. I could not build for my own people, the Afrikaners, a good future in South Africa if there's injustice towards the majority of all South Africans. So justice was in my political life, for me, the guiding principle. Fine. I, uh, let's go to apartheid. I know that you talked about that for a lot of times. Uh, you ended apartheid for many reasons, but I want to know what's the most important reason. Is it seeking justice, as you just said, or is it acting before it's too late for the future of your country? The ruling party now in South Africa wants to project the picture that we did it because we had no other choice. That's not true. We could have hung on to power. We could have continued with old policies. In the end, it might have ended and in all probability would have ended in a civil war. So there were two, for me, two driving principles applying which which brought me to the point to do what I did. Firstly, the injustice of apartheid. I issued a f profound apology for the pain and the suffering and the injustice that segregation, that racial discrimination, that apartheid has brought. So it was my conscience which said, you must put this, what is wrong, right. Mm. You can't just say, I'm sorry. You must take initiatives to bring justice to everybody. The second was the realization, and I think Mr. Mandela also realized it, that if we did not negotiate a new dispensation, if we did not make peace and end the conflict, that South Africa would become severely, severely damaged, that we might have had a catastrophe in South Africa, where hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people would die. 
And at the end of that, we would have had to negotiate. So it was on the one hand a quest to end injustice. On the other hand, it was the focus on avoiding a catastrophe. Mr. President, uh, let me talk about uh, Middle East, the Middle East. We're facing big problems and one of the main reasons is racism when it comes to religion or different other reasons. What do you think is the solution? Is it by making laws or do you have another way of good solutions? I think the world of today and mo many countries face two big challenges. The one is to close the gap between the haves and the have-nots, to bring in equality to an end. That's the one. The other one is, how do you manage diversity? Whether it is ethnic diversity, linguistic diversity, cultural diversity, or religious diversity. With globalization, all countries are becoming more and more of multicultural nature than we've had in the past. And we need to manage that. And this was our challenge in South Africa in negotiating a new constitution. Proof of how multicultural we are is we agreed between Mandela and me and our teams that we should recognize in our constitution 11 official languages. There are nine black languages as different from each other as French is from German. And then there's Afrikaans, my mother tongue, and then there's English. So the challenge is to manage that. And how do you do that? The guiding principle is you must not force people to choose between different identities. All of us have more than one identity. I'm an Afrikaner, I'm a South African, and I'm an African. Mandela was a Kosa, a South African, and an African. And likewise, all of us have multiple identities. And you mustn't say, you cannot be a good South African if you, unless you stop being also an Afrikaner. And I think this principle needs to be applied to create room and space for each person's and each group's identity to flourish and to exist and for them to speak their language, to teach their children in the language of their choice, to create room and space, but on the other hand, at the same time, to also build overarching umbrellas of unity. So with our 11 languages in South Africa, we are a South African nation. When our teams win or when our athletes win at the Olympic Games, we're all proud irrespective of which of the 11 languages we speak. So it's not a choice between being together part of a greater whole or a choice between being part of a smaller entity, you can be both. And in, in that sense of the word, uh, the management of diversity needs to be balanced and need to avoid forcing people into little boxes. Minorities must be made to feel that they are building blocks of the greater whole. They are not stumbling blocks, but they are part of the greater whole. That they are welcomed as part of the greater whole, instead of that they are in the way and stumbling blocks. Mr. President, uh, we talked about Nelson Mandela a lot. Uh, let me uh, say that you had a long relationship with him. It started from you giving him freedom, taking him out of jail, you also uh, gave him and his race the right to, to, to rule the country. And also you became a vice president to him after being the president. Uh, how did that all start? How, how, how was your relationship with him? Well, he was a wonderful man. 
when I met him the first time, he was still a prisoner. Yes. And he was brought under cover of darkness to my office, which later became his office. And at that first meeting, we recognized in each other a person who was willing to listen, who was prepared to argue in a peaceful and constructive manner. And I think we built some trust at that very first meeting. Later on, we had big confrontations between the two of us because we were also political opponents. But that basic trust and mutual respect never left us. Later on, after both of us retired and we were no longer opponents, we became really good friends. He was a guest of me and my wife. We were guests of him and his wife. We had meals in each other's homes. We regularly spoke on the phone. His greatest legacy for South Africa was his emphasis on the need for reconciliation. He had a remarkable lack of bitterness after 27 years in jail. And he said, South Africa is for all its people. When I served as deputy president, I didn't serve as a member of his party. I didn't join his party. I was the leader of the second biggest party in South Africa. But we believed we needed a form of government of national unity where we could in cabinet, in government, work out deals and build consensus about the challenges which our country faced. And we succeeded in doing that for a number of years until I retired. Mr. President, did Mandela deserve jail? In terms of the law of South Africa, but in terms of the law of any developed country, what he wanted to do as a young man when he had a fair trial in South Africa was a crime which deserved, if found guilty on the evidence, quite a strict and severe sentence. It was, he was, at a, as a young man, guilty of treason. The fact that he was motivated by fighting against suppression and against racism, of course, made it, from his point of view, a justifiable cause. And I think that fact was the reason why the court did not give him the most serious uh, judgment that mm -hmm. he could have given, because as our law was then, he could have been given the death sentence. But on looking back, we should have started talking. The leadership of those times should have started engaging with each other at a much earlier time than 1989 and 1990, when Mandela and I started talking to each other. There were many lost opportunities. في الثاني من فبراير سنة 1990 ألقى فريدريك ديكليرك خطابا بالغ الأهمية شكل منعطف تاريخي في جنوب أفريقيا أعلم من خلاله عن إطلاق سراح مجموعة كبيرة من السجناء السياسيين كان من أبرزهم شريكه في الحكم لاحقا نيلسون مانديلا كما أعلن أيضا عن التصريح بإنشاء أحزاب سياسية تمثل الغالبية السوداء قرارات حكيمة قادت فريدريك ديكليرك مع شريكه نيلسون مانديلا الحصول على جائزة نوبل للسلام عام 1993. Today I'm able to announce far-reaching decisions. Legislation is to be tabled shortly for the repeal of the Land Acts of 1913 and 1936. كان خطاب ديكليرك مفاجأة للكثيرين 
فلم يكن مر على انتخابه رئيسا أكثر من خمسة أشهر في وقت انتشرت فيه أعمال العنف بكافة أنحاء البلاد وكان الاقتصاد يترنح تحت ضغط العقوبات التي فرضها المجتمع الدولي على بريتوريا كان هذا القرار خطوة شجاعة هدفت إلى تجنيب البلاد خطر السقوط في هاوية الفوضى وحتى الأسقف والمناضل السياسي المعروف ديزمون توتو تملكته الدهشة من خطاب ديكليرك حيث صرح قائلا لطالما كنت مؤمنا أن مانديلا سيطلق سراحه يوما ما ولكني لم أعتقد أن هذا سيحدث وأنا على قيد الحياة Mr. President, you, this question you've answered a lot, but let me re rephrase it and ask you again. You insist on not apologizing for the original concept. Uh, people sometimes, they're mixed with how is it possible you apologize and not apologize. Why do you insist on not apologizing on the original concept? I'm sorry, I don't insist on not apologizing. I, in a follow-up statement after I had an interview with Amanpour, on CNN. made it clear that I unqualifiedly say apartheid was wrong. What I was saying in my interview with her and why there is this impression that I insist on not apologizing for the original concept, I was trying to explain why in a different era I, as a young man, originally supported apartheid. I was not justifying apartheid. Apartheid was wrong, and I said that clearly in a profound apology which I made. Mr. President, yesterday I met a businessman in a restaurant here in Cape Town. He told me, yes, apartheid, we are done with apartheid by law. But he feels that apartheid is still exists between the people. Do you have any comment on that? I think apartheid exists around the world between people. <laughs> South Africa is not unique in the sense that there is racial discrimination everywhere. It's a very heated debate in America right at this point in time. There's the Black Lives Matter campaign going on in America. It's happening all across the world. I think it's happening in the Arabic countries with migrant labor. And there are complaints that those people are not getting the rights which they should get in terms of a human rights approach to life. So it is a universal problem which needs attention. Racial discrimination is wrong. The only way in which to overcome racial discrimination is to have a fair legal system. To my mind, and that is why I worked for it in South Africa, to have, as we have, a good Bill of Rights guaranteeing the rights of all people. Also, one needs to get to know each other. Racial tension usually arises from stereotyping to say all Afrikaners are like this, all blacks are like that. That's nonsense. You can only break down those stereotypes by talking to each other, by building bridges instead of building walls. And that is what we must do, especially in multicultural society. Mr. President, you talked about the Arab world and how, how justice is needed all over the world. Uh, if you allow me, I would like to talk about Palestine. You know, sometimes you refer to that issue and when you compare it with apartheid. Don't you think or do you agree? My point of view is that what's happening now in Palestine is even worse than slavery or apartheid itself. Do you agree? Well, firstly, when you refer to Palestine, do you include Israel in Palestine or not? There is this situation that there is a state of Israel which is generally speaking recognized globally. 
They are the Palestinian people. And there are only two solutions, possible solutions, for the situation in what I would like to call Israel-Palestine or Palestine-Israel. The one is a two-state solution, or the other is a one-state solution. And I'm on record to say that if the two-state solution does not succeed, and if everybody living in that area is to be regarded as living in one country, then it would become apartheid if Israelis have more rights than Palestinians have, or Palestinians have more rights than Israelis have, then it would become apartheid. I'm basically a supporter of the two-state solution. But I think the window on that might be closing. And there is a great need for real and meaningful negotiation between the leaders of the Palestinian and the Israelis. It's not taking place. I think too much international interference in the past have caused this failure to negotiate meaningfully. In the case of South Africa, outside forces were helpful, but South Africans negotiated between themselves. And the people of Israel, Palestine, Palestine, Israel need to find a way of co peaceful coexistence. That can only be achieved through negotiation. You are a, a person that knows how to see future or to, to, to think about future. What do you think is the future of my region, of my country, the Middle East? What do you, how do you see the Middle East? Where is it going to? The future is more often than not directed by what you do in the present. The future is in the hands of the present leadership. It's also in the hands of the youth of your country and your neighboring countries. The challenge for leadership is to constantly do introspection. If you just try to maintain the status quo, then from some sources will come demands for fundamental change because things are developing. Technology is developing. People are, have more access to information. All this gives rise to new needs and will give rise to new demands. I believe the challenge for leaders of today are to anticipate that, to take initiatives. If I can use us as an example, what I did in 1990 was the result of deep introspection, of admitting to myself and the rest of my team did the same, that apartheid was wrong, we were in a place which was morally unjustifiable. And on that basis we said, so how do we change this? I could have made the announcements which I made on the 2nd of February 1990, releasing not only Mandela or political prisoners, unbanning all the organizations which were banned and which were not allowed to operate politically speaking. I could have just said Mandela will be released but not all political prisoners. I could have did, done it step by step. If I did that, I would not have been in a position to co-manage the process of fundamental change. Everything I did thereafter would have been regarded as giving in under pressure. But because I took an initiative and announced changes which were not even expected from me to be announced, it gave me the moral high ground and it gave me power to influence what happened thereafter in a constructive way, not as a loser, but as a co-architect of a new dispensation. So I'm, I'm not an expert on the Arab world, 
But I think the leaders of today need to accept the challenge to say, where do I want my country to be in 30 years' time? And to work out a vision for that. In managing change, having a, a vision. A vision is not a 30-page document. It's three paragraphs. A vision. Then, once you formulated that vision, and once you get your support base, in the case of a country, your citizens, or a majority of those citizens, to embrace that vision, to say, we like that vision. Then you work out action plans. Now, what do I do to achieve that vision? This is the process we went through in South Africa. Well said, Mr. President. Can we go to our next location, please? Okay. Thank you. إذا كانت شعبية فريدريك ديكلير قد انزوت أمام شعبية نيلسون مانديلا وإذا كان التاريخ والأحداث الكبيرة فيه تكتب بيد المنتصر فإن ذكر الدور الكبير الذي لعبه فريدريك ديكلير في تاريخ جنوب أفريقيا بل وفي تاريخ أفريقيا ككل واجب أخلاقي وأدبي Mr. President Let's talk about democracy You have defined democracy in your own words I'm quoting you here, Mr. President. You said that not every solid democracy means that it's a healthy one. What do you mean? Well, we, in our constitution, which we negotiated between 1990 and 1996, entrenched multi-party democracy. It is guaranteed in terms of the constitution. But at one stage, the African National Congress had 67% of the vote, and all other parties only 33. That's not a healthy democracy. It's almost like a one-party state. And what I meant by it, and what I mean by it, is a healthy democracy in a typical Western-style democracy is where you're not sure who will win the next election, where there is real competition, because that keeps politicians on their toes and it keeps them humble. If you are so sure that, that you will win the next election and the next election and the next election, then you can easily become undemocratic yourself because you feel you are entitled to power. Democracy is not a perfect system, but to my mind, I'm a Democrat, it's the best political system. But I think the concept democracy is used too loosely in the public debates. Some people tend to say, Democracy is what the American Constitution says democracy is. Other people say democracy is what the Westminster system in England is. There can be many types of democracy. I'm a great believer that countries who are not democratic in the Western sense can move to an own brand of democracy that countries can develop democratic systems taking into account their culture and their religion and their customs and royal royalty, things like that. All that can be blended into systems which are democratic but which takes into account other realities as well. So one shouldn't put democracy 
in a little box and say there's only one type of democracy. I believe there are many possibilities of de democratizing societies, but not throwing out the baby with the bathwater. Well, what you mean, what you said yesterday, that every society has the right to create their own democracy. Is that what you mean? I'm, what, what I believe is that societies need, which have no democracy at all, need to democratize, but should be allowed to develop their own brand and their own type of democracy, fitting in with their circumstances, with their customs, and with the realities in their countries. If you allow me, Mr. President, in the Middle East there is multiple countries that made a huge development without democracy. So is it a need to reach development? Is it a must to have democracy to reach development? No, uh, there are many instances in history where under benevolent dictators, countries have flourished. But then there are many examples in history when benevolent dictators were replaced by dictators who are not so benevolent and who misuse the power. In the end, democracy gives checks and balances against bad leaders, but it gives room and scope to good leaders. But development is not a prerequisite. Uh, democracy is not a prerequisite for development. At, uh, right at this point in time, China is the best example. It's not a, a really, de it's not a democratic country at all. But look at its financial growth and development. But fact is, in China, there are thousands, if hundreds of thousands, if not millions of young people who want democracy. We've seen what happened in Hong Kong. So I think in the modern era, the globalized world in which we live, especially young people are looking for changes and want to influence decisions more than they are allowed to in certain systems. And I think wise leaders will anticipate that these demands will come up and will find ways and means in a reasonable way which won't destabilize their countries in a reasonable way, providing for reasonable demands in that regard. Okay, Mr. President. Now, if you allow me, I'll ask you questions that uh, I would expect I respond with a yes or a no. And if you want to comment on a later stage, then it's your right. My first question is, Democracy, I'll tell you a statement and you say whether you agree or not. Democracy looks for quantity, not quality. Yes or no? Yes and no. Bad democracy looks just for quantity. Good democracy looks for quality. Some democracies are bad, some democracies are good. Mr. President, Tutu said that he has a point of view of the current government and he said that it, is, it, it, even, it might be worse than the apartheid government. Do you agree or you disagree? The current government? The current situation of the government. The, the current situation into which the government has brought us in South Africa is a very bad one. I don't like a comparison with apartheid, but from especially an economic point of view, yes, we have, don't have a good government at the moment. And they're damaging the interests of all South Africans. Let me ask you about the United States. You just mentioned them. Is it the, the best ever system possible or the best democra democracy in the world? Is it in the U.S., yes or no? No. It's a good one, but there are other good ones which are totally different as well. Equality doesn't always 
reflect justice, yes or no? No. And can you tell us why? Justice demands that there should be checks and balances. Justice demands that somehow or another minorities should be accommodated in a special way. Simple equality does not always in a meaningful way create room and space for important minorities, whether it be religious minorities or ethnic minorities. Mr. President, you had a dream for South Africa, one united South Africa, and you worked for that. You gave a lot for that. Do you think that in this system, South Africa will become what, whatever you dreamed of, yes or no? Yes, it has the capacity, but we still have a long way to go. Mr. President, do you have any regrets? I, on the big decisions I had to take, I have no regrets. With the full advantage of hindsight, knowing what has happened actually, all the major decisions I took, I would take again. On many smaller ones, with the advantage of hindsight, I might have adopted different strategies here and there, I might have changed my approach, I might have changed my timing, but on the big decisions I took, no regrets. I had to do it to avoid a catastrophe, and I had to do it to bring justice. عند الحديث عن التحولات الديمقراطية الكبيرة في جنوب أفريقيا على يد نيلسون مانديلا عادة ما يتم التغاضي عن دور أسس ومهد لكل هذه التغيرات على يد الرئيس الجنوب أفريقي الأسبق فريدريك ديكليرك الرجل الذي كانت له القدرة على مواجهة شعبه الأبيض متنازلا ومضحيا بمغانم كثيرة كانت للبيض على حساب السود مستر <تصفيق> We talked about equality, uh, and I want to go back for the yes or no questions, if you don't mind. Equality doesn't always deliver justice, yes or no? If you phrase the question that way, the, the answer is no, but I want to qualify the no. You cannot have justice without equality. But having equality does not guarantee that you will have justice. There can be, in an equal society, still injustice. Understood. Mr. President, I would, would love to go back uh, to the time of apartheid, not to talk about apartheid. I want to talk about the nuclear weapons, uh, the timing of giving away the nuclear weapons. Can you just justify that issue? The whole cabinet of South Africa never knew that we were building nu nuclear weapons. When I was a younger minister, I became Minister of Mineral and Energy Affairs. And I had to be brought into the circle who had to know about it. I didn't like it, and I then decided, if I ever become president, I will scrap it for South Africa because I don't believe it was necessary and I don't believe it was in the best interests of South Africa and I am against nuclear weapons as a person. So when I became president, one of the first things I did was to call this inner group who knew about it together and say, we're going to sign the non-proliferation treaty and we're going to demolish these weapons and we're going to 
take a stance that Africa must be, become the first continent totally nuclear weapon free. And I did exactly that. Also, doing that helped to establish in the eyes of all the critics who were isolating South Africa, the fact that we were not playing with words, that we were following words with real deeds of great and important meaning. Mr. President, how the books of history will mention President F.W. de Klerk? It is not for me to write my own epitaph. I hope that the books of history will say that I made a difference, a positive difference, through my contributions in my role as President of South Africa and in my role afterwards to South Africa and in wider context. Your party, your political party, Mr. President, uh, how do you see your political party? What, what, what role did you give and take from that party? Well, let's start at the present. My political party has disappeared. Yes. Because it was the party of apartheid, somehow or another, after becoming in the 94 election the second biggest party, it disappeared by my successor, he couldn't make the grade, he couldn't attract the votes, its support started declining, and in the end he uh, dissolved the party. But I'm proud of the National Party under my and my predecessor's leadership. We as a party accepted the challenge of the necessity for fundamental, far-reaching change. We accepted the challenge of saying we will rectify the injustices of apartheid and we will bring justice to all in South Africa. And I'm deeply thankful that throughout my presidency and my leadership of that party, we were able to continue to have the support of the majority of the white people and the brown people of South Africa. Mr. President, you won the Nobel Prize and you shared it with Nelson Mandela. Uh, what does that mean to you, the Nobel Prize? Nobel Prize was, I think, a courageous decision by the Nobel Committee to give it to me. Giving it to Mr. Mandela was popular. Giving it to me was controversial. But it was a recognition, not of my role as an individual, but a recognition of the role of white South Africans in voluntarily ending apartheid, accepting a new dispensation, which inevitably would lead to them no longer being the dominant force in the country. Mr. President, after politics, you, 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 you ended the life of politics uh, as a leader, uh, doing your job as a president, as a vice president. What, after, what, what happened after that? Well, I retired from party politics altogether and I'm still not involved in party politics in any meaningful way. I go and vote, yes, but I'm not active in party politics. I started first the F.W. de Klerk Foundation which is focused on upholding the Constitution, which was negotiated between 1990 and 1996. Because that Constitution is under pressure. There are those people in the ruling party of the moment who say, Mr. Mandela made too many concessions, who are unhappy with aspects in that Constitution. And I fundamentally believe, and so did Mr. Mandela, that that constitution encapsulated uh, an accord, uh, a solemn accord which we reached, and it should not be tampered with, and it should be a living document. So I'm still busy with that. We have a center for constitutional rights, and we are making a difference. Also, this foundation 
is working for unity in our diversity. And then, uh, 12 years ago, I started an international foundation mm -hmm. called the Global Leadership Foundation where I now have 36 former presidents, prime ministers, cabinet ministers, senior diplomats. And we, not for money, it's not a business, not profitable. not profitable. We give quiet, confidential advice to governments in the developing world mostly on governance issues. All of us have good experience and we advise leaders in leading positions at the moment what can they do to make things better in their country? Talk about, let's talk about your lifestyle. What is now those daily basis lifestyle? You said you, you travel a lot. My wife and I travel a lot for, I would say, more than four months a year. We're not at home. Wow. We, I'm involved in, in many conferences and speeches. Uh, I do some fundraising for these foundations and that in involves some travels. Uh, I'm invited quite often to participate uh, as a keynote speaker in events. So all that takes us uh, overseas a lot. And my wife from a former marriage has three children in London and five grandchildren in London. And that also takes us to London. God bless them all. Uh, then, uh, uh, Apart from all the travels that we do, we enjoy a wonderful lifestyle in one of the most beautiful coastal cities in the whole world, Cape Town. Yes, sir. We have, we're very happy in our home. I have an office at my foundation. On any normal weekday, I go to the office. I still work, but my compromise with retirement is I only go to the office at 10 in the morning and not so early. <laughs> Uh, Mr. President, uh, you were married before being a president. Uh, you talked about family. Uh, did politics took you away from your family some in certain days? Oh yes, in my during my political career, I was quite often an absent father. I have three children uh, from my first marriage, and uh, they're all grown up now, uh, and they're all becoming middle-aged as well. Uh, but they have forgiven me. I grew up in a home where my father was absent because he had a political career. And uh, they understood that I was rendering service in a greater scope than just at home. But I tried to make up for those absences by quality attention to my children. And we have good bonds and good relationships and it did not create uh, very deep wounds if i can put it that way mr president you took very important decisions huge calls do you think of your family point of view of those decisions and those point of view of course uh, when one takes decisions which might affect your family you also think of it from a family point of view but if you're the leader of a country or of a ruling party in a country, then you think of the interests of all. And one of the challenges for leadership is to balance conflicting interests. In all societies, there are conflicting interests. In business, there are conflicting interests. Yeah, of course. The owner of the business wants to make profit the clients of the business wants to buy at the lowest possible price. It's a conflicting interest. And the challenge for leadership is to balance conflicting interests. My, one of my deep philosophies in life is that more often than not, the real answer to problems lie in achieving proper balance. Mr. President, sorry we took a lot of your time and we even took you out of the game of rugby no problem. between Australia and South Africa. We, now the, the match already started. What do you think the result would be? I think it's going to be very close. <laughs> but I think South Africa will win today. Sure. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Thank Madame. you very Thank much. Thank you for having us in your house. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank, Thank you, you so ma'am. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.